Good morning. 大家早上好。First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. I've been looking forward to、uh, preach this morning. But as、uh, Murphy Law has it, I was on the way out and then found that I was having some problem with my car. I tried to fix it and I started to perspire. I realized I couldn't do it. I went back, had to take a shower, change again, <laughs> took a cab, and that's why I was 15 minutes late. I do apologize. It is never kind to be late. Thank you for your patience. The topic given to me is very interesting. It's、uh, come unity, communion, and unity. Communion is the act of sharing. That's why we come together and have a Lord's supper, and we call that communion. The coming together, the gathering together. Unity is also the act of oneness. Now listen carefully. Being together in itself is not always a sign of oneness. We can be together and be divided. So the idea of coming together in a com. Union or community or com unity is the idea of having blended both the coming together and the oneness. As we're thinking of、uh, the three words I want to leave with you afterwards in this sermon, I thought of three words during the the French Revolution. The French Revolution, where they overthrew the monarch and became a republic. Took place between 1789 and 1799, a length of 10 years. It was a very significant period in the history of Western civilization, because this particular revolution had a great influence on the way the West started to think in terms of politics, in terms of government. And even in terms of religion, the Catholic Church was very dominant in France for a very long time, and this revolution changed the way the Catholic Church operated in France as well. It was a turning point in the history of Western democracy, from the age of absolutism, where the monarch is above the law almost, to The age of citizenry and citizen participation in politics. And what was the slogan during that time? In French, it was "Liberté, Égalité, and Fraternité." And the last part most people do not remember is "Ou la mort," meaning meaning liberty. Equality, fraternity, or death reminds us of、uh, Patrick Henry's words into the American during the Revolution: "Give me liberty, or give me death." It was not original; he copied from the French Revolution, and this became the rallying cry for many people in the world after that, who wanted democracy as opposed to. Monarchy or aristocracy. What's the three words I want to leave with you? It is simply conformity, and I'll explain what that is. Unity and service ability. Conformity, unity, and service ability. The first is conformity with Christ. Verses one to two in the text that our sister read. And、uh, I want to read Romans twelve verse one to two、uh, in parallel with that. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, 
by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, Paul says. Holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world. I spoke about conformity, but what is that? It's not conforming to the world. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And Paul in Philippians talked so much about the mind of Christ. That is the renewal of your mind and that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and what is acceptable and perfect. So this conformity, the first word I want to use as a slogan for all of us is not conforming to the world but conforming to Christ. It is that by being transformed and having the mind of Christ, we may truly be conformed to the standards of Christ in our life. To be of the same mind and the same love as Christ has for us. Or being in full accord as we have read in Philippians. So now I used to joke around and tell people that the first Japanese car was actually exported in the first century of the Christian church when they were all in one accord Honda Accord this is not the same word as in Acts chapter 1 verse 14 but it has the same meaning in fact uh, the idea of one accord is to be in full and perfect and complete unity and so we read in Acts 1, 14, they were all together in one accord ten times in different contexts and how they were devoting themselves in one accord. So the question is, why do we need to have this one accord? Why do we need to have this conformity together in one accord? Because Paul says it is an encouragement in Christ. Second, it is a comfort from love. Third, it is a participation in the spirit. And fourth, it is affection and sympathy. And Paul says, you can complete my joy. Complete my joy. Paul was an apostle, a preacher, a missionary, a pastor. And he asked his people to give him joy. I think we all need to give joy to one another. And how do we do that? We do that by being conformed to Christ so that we can begin to manifest the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the stuff that we have just read in Philippians about uh, love, about affection, about sympathy, these are part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We read in Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so on. We give joy to one another in our conformity to Christ when we manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Paul is saying, let me have the joy of seeing you bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let me have the comfort, he was saying, of your love, of seeing you bearing the fruit of the Spirit, of love, of sympathy. These things give me joy. In other words, when we are Christ-like, when we bear the resemblance of Christ in our life by being conformed to Christ, we give joy to one another. Be Christ-like. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is about being Christ-like. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The question for us, therefore, as fellow workers in this vineyard of children's education, of, of uh, welfare homes, of senior citizens' uh, nursing home, of all the wonderful things that the welfare uh, uh, society of the Presbyterian Church have been doing, the welfare services, what is it all about? It is that men and women and children may see the good works that we do and glorify us and say, oh, what a wonderful Presbyterian church Christians they are about our welfare services, 
about all the board members, about the Christian church? No. That they may see God and glorify Him whom He cannot see. Men and women cannot see God. God is invisible. They cannot see Christ. Christ has risen, ascended. But every day, every moment, when we are kind, when we are doing good works, when we are manifesting the fruit of the Holy Spirit, they are seeing Christ in us. And they're going to say, what is it that makes this person different? What is it that makes this nursing home different? What is it that makes this child care school different? It's the Christ in us. And therefore, we need to conform to Christ. The second word is the word unity in Christ, verse 3 to 4. The one accord, the one mind. And so Paul unpacks it in verse 3 to 4. Talks about other centeredness. Other centeredness. He says here in verses 3 to 4 Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. In my book, uh, my other book, uh, Five Amazing Benefits of Being Kind, I define kindness as other-centeredness. When you say thank you to somebody, you are being other-centered. When you appreciate somebody, you are being other-centered. When you are generous to somebody, you are being other-centered. When you appreciate somebody, you are being other-centered. When you respect somebody, you are being other-centered. Kindness is simply other-centeredness and not self-centeredness. And that's what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about unity in terms of being other-centered. If you are selfish and self-centered, we cannot have unity. So in the SKM movement within our own small number of staff we encourage one another to say as often as we can eyeballing each other and say how can I set you up for success in the work we do it is not how can you help me to succeed how can you help me to climb this corporate ladder not that it is about how can I your colleague set you up for success when we keep doing that to one another we are setting each other up for success then as the tide rises all of us rise together we leave nobody behind in our appraisal system at skm i make sure that we appraise each other also for teamwork not just for individual success i don't really care to engage you in the kindness movement even if you are the most talented, the most educated, that has the most number of degrees, if you cannot work with the remaining part of my team, if you cannot work with others, you will not impress me. The key to success at SKM is that we work together and we work with other partners and we always say, in kindness, there is no competition only collaboration so be other centered be humble oh the bible has so much to say about humility he mocks the proud mockers but shows favor to the humble and oppressed when pride comes then comes disgrace but with humility comes wisdom these are all from proverbs Michael 6 8 is one of my favorite verses as a lawyer. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy. In fact, in the ESV translation, it is to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. To walk humbly with your God. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up, James says. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, in efficiency. 
And of course, this very famous verse, if my people, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, I will heal their land. Humility. There is also a false kind of humility which sometimes we hear people practice. You affirm them, you praise them, you appreciate them, and they say, no, 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 no. You know, but if you don't do that, they get really upset with you. That's not humility. So what are some of the characteristics of humility? They acknowledge they don't have it all together. None of us has it all together. They know the difference between self-confidence and pride. Our self-confidence is rested in the confidence that God has in us and in our confidence in God, not in ourselves per se. So we must know the difference between self-confidence and pride. Humble people seek to add value to others. That's why we ask, how can I set you up for success? That's why we believe in synergy. Synergy is so important. Our ED talked about synergy quite a bit just now. Sin energy. The energy that comes together. The energy that comes together. You bring your energy, I bring my energy. We put it together, it's synergy. They seek to add value to others. They take responsibility for their actions. I tell my staff, you have the permission to make mistakes, but do not repeat the same mistakes. And learn from that mistake. Take responsibility. Never cover up your mistake. Because if you cover your mistake, you will repeat that mistake. And I wouldn't know about your mistake, and I can't help you. But if you are open about your mistake, you admit your mistake, you take responsibility for your mistake, you're willing to learn from your mistake, you can go much further. Humble people understand the shadow side of success. We know what failure is before we know what success is. If we don't know anything about failure, we will not really appreciate what success is. And humble people are filled with gratitude for what they have. I like gratitude. Gratitude is one of the great values of kindness. Gratitude is about an attitude of not taking anything for granted. An attitude of saying everything I have is given to me. There's nothing for me to take credit for. That's gratitude. I like the story about Alex Haley who wrote a famous book called Roots. Eventually he got into a bit of trouble but his book Roots uh, was made into many mini-series on TV and became very popular. In his office, Alex Haley has a huge picture painting of a turtle on a post, on top of a post. And people will look at that and say, what's so good about this picture, Alex? And Alex will say, this picture is very important to me. And they ask, how so? And he said, because every time I look at this picture, I am reminded that I am the turtle and I didn't get up on that post by myself. Have you ever seen a turtle climb a post or tree or anything? None. The turtle is completely helpless when you turn turtle belly up. You have to pick that turtle up and put it on the post. And Alex Haley said, you know, I am reminded that there are many, many people who pick me up and that's why I'm up on that post. Of course, my parents, my siblings, my friends, my teachers, my professors, many people along the journey of life put me up there. So what is there for me to be proud about my achievement? I'm ever and forever grateful, he said. Gratitude. My brothers and sisters, pride divides. Pride doesn't create synergy. Humility unites. When we are humble towards one another and recognize each of us, no matter which role we play, that we are all equal before God. That the function we do, depending, of course, on our skills and so on, 
is also, they are also gifts of God. Thank God that we can work together. And finally, besides the word, uh, the first two words that I mentioned, uh, we have the third word, and the third word is serviceability. So conformity, unity, and now we talk about serviceability, verse 5 to 8. God has given us the gifts to serve. We all know that. We can read about that in Romans chapter 12. By grace were given, you know, to me that I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly. Paul says that again in Romans chapter 12. Why? And you must also not think more highly than you ought to, but to think with sober judgment. Why? Again, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. God has assigned. God has given us. So don't think too highly of ourselves. What we have is given by God. What you have is given by God. And we are not here to compare and compete. We are here to complement. So Paul says, As in one body we have many members, and members do not do the same function, so we, though many, we are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Elsewhere, he said, you know, the, 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 the eye cannot say to the nose, and you know, you are not worthy, you know, that kind of illustration. And it is the same with the body. You know, our eyes cannot be so proud to say that our mouth is useless. Because without the mouth, the eyes will not live because we will die. And so we need one another. And so it goes on that we are given gifts according to the grace that has been given to us, etc., etc. So service starts with humility. The recognition, the acknowledgement that everything we have is given to us. So it's not just about aptitude, talents and gifts. It is about attitude the attitude of humility the attitude of wanting to complement each other it is an attitude and this attitude must be focused on the life of Jesus Christ and that's what Paul is saying here let each of us look not only to our own interests, but to the interests of others. Have this mind in you, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count it equality with God, a thing to be grasped. Just because I'm given certain gifts that the world thinks is sort of superior, I shouldn't hold on to it like I'm such a great guy. That is how I would translate it. Even here in this beautiful sanctuary, there are professors, there are uh, junior workers, there are teachers, there are homemakers, there are all sorts of people. But we are all given the gift and nobody should grasp that and believe that we are more superior because we have that. Be like Christ. He emptied himself, verse 7, and he took the form of a servant. And being born in the likeness of man, he found it himself in human flesh. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death. We can only be serviceable to God, serviceable to our Lord Jesus Christ, if we truly desire to be like him. To be a servant of all. He said more than once, if you want to be the greatest, then be the servant of all. Be the servant of all. In 1904, William Borden, heir to the Borden Dairy, Dairy Estate, graduated from Chicago High School. A millionaire. As a high school graduate, his parents already inherited him and took him on a world tour as not just an heir of a millionaire but a millionaire in his own right 17 years old traveling through Asia, the Middle East, Europe Borden received a burden from God 
for the world's hurting people. Writing home even as a 17-year-old, he said, I'm going to give my life to prepare for the mission field. When he made his decision, he wrote at the back of his Bible two words, no reserves. And then he went to Yale University and graduated. And then when he graduated, he turned down some of the higher paying jobs offered to him. And he entered the seminary. At the end of the Bible, he wrote next to the word no reserves, no retreats. No retreats. I'm going forward to serve in a mission field. And then completing his studies at Princeton University, a seminary, Borden sailed for China to work with the Muslims. His first stop was in Egypt to learn the language. Unfortunately, he died there because of uh, he was stricken with cerebral meningitis. And he died a month after arriving in Egypt. How old was Borden of Yale? I am 75. Borden of Yale is one third my age exactly. 25. And you say, what a waste. What's God doing? God makes no mistakes. And I don't understand. I have my good friends or missionaries who are much more talented than I am, who learned the Japanese language, could speak and teach in Japanese, and God took him in his, you know, below 60 years of age. I don't understand that. God has his purpose, and because of this death, many young people from Yale graduated and went off to China. Yale at one point produced the most number of missionaries to China. Why? Because of Borden Nabil. His inheritance, he gave them all to missions. All of it. The man was serviceable in his life, in his lifetime, and was serviceable in his death. What about us? I think our serviceability is not just about our ability to serve while we live. I think we should be giving, we should be having some form of a uh, a will that will leave behind money for mission, money for work of the church, money for health care, uh, you know, whatever we want to give to charity. It should continue. But the point I want to make about Gordon of, Gordon of Yale is that he equipped himself, he was determined, he was very clear about his purpose in life, he stayed the course. And that's how he was serviceable. My brothers and sisters, you are given a great opportunity to serve God today by molding the minds of the young, by bringing comfort to the old, by doing so many wonderful things through the Presbyterian service opportunities. You are going to equip many of these children to become upright citizens in the future leaders of our nation. You're helping them to inculcate positive values, kindness and goodness so that they in turn can also serve in some of the other seniors' homes that uh, I'm sure you're going to build more in time. You are going to help them be positive and see things from the perspective of God and an attitude of humility but you cannot do it alone you know that none of you alone is so qualified and so good that you can do everything the rest of us do together and that's why we need this calm unity we can do it together with the right aptitude and the mindset of humility that mindset comes from conformity with Christ as Christ's disciples, we must be imitators of Christ and let everyone see Christ in us. Christ also wants us to be united. He prayed that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us so that the world may believe, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Elsewhere I said, the Lord says, let your light so shine before men 
that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Only with our standards conforming to Christ's standards of love and compassion and our unity in commitment to the vision and mission of the Presbyterian Community Services can we be truly serviceable to Christ. So what are the three words? It's not liberty. It's not... Uh, uh, what is the other one that the French are talking about? It's not, uh, it's not liberty, it's not fraternity. It is not equality. It is... What can we say? It is conformity. It is unity. And it is serviceability. Let's substitute that and let's move forward as God's people. Thank you and God bless you.